happy Wednesday, everybody. I am so excited about you joining me tonight for this incredible lesson and message of transparency and truth with the goal being healing, the goal being a moment where individuals can see the light at the end of the tunnel and know that it's not an oncoming train, but it is actually hope. I want to start tonight with Psalms chapter 143, and I want to read verses 7 through 8 from the ESV translation. It says, Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. What a perfect verse for tonight's topic. Tonight's topic is how I defeated the spirit of depression and why I still have to fight the seduction of suicide. Hmm, this is going to be an awesome lesson tonight. I woke up this morning clearly sensing and hearing God's voice. And his voice said to me, I want you to tell your story tonight. He went on to say again, I want you to teach your story. And I responded to God by saying, I've already taught my story. I've already told my story. Uh, it's on social media already. God says, no, tonight I want you to be even more transparent than you have ever been before. And I want you to teach so that you can help those individuals who are going through what you've gone through, but they're going through it silently. They're going through it privately. And some are going through it in a way that is not going to end well if they don't get a degree of understanding if they don't get a degree of clarity, and if they don't get a degree of hope. That being said, here I am tonight to talk to you personally about how I defeated depression and what may surprise some of you is why I still have to fight the seduction of suicide. But before I get into that, I want to start talking about purpose because in my battles and my struggles, with depression and suicide, I have come to realize and recognize how important and how paramount purpose is. I would ask you the question to you, how important is purpose in your mind, in your perspective, in your understanding? Then the second question I might ask you is how important is it to live a life of purpose? And those are the two questions we want to jostle between tonight. When I talk about living a life of purpose, I'm talking about the reason why you live, and I'm also talking about the meaning of your life. So I'm talking about two things, the reason why you live and the meaning of your life. To me, that's what purpose is. Now, it's important that I provide clarity whenever I teach on the importance or the power of purpose. Here's why, because there are a plethora of way too many inaccurate and inadequate definitions, which is why so many people struggle understanding and underscoring a clear purpose in their lives. As a side note, I feel it's important that I tell you as well as warn you, and this is a warning. I want to warn you about falling into the trap of believing and thinking that busyness is proof of purpose. I was that person a long time ago who thought that busyness was proof of purpose because I was busy. I thought I was living a life of purpose. I thought I was fulfilling some sort of purpose simply because I was busy. Let me clear my throat. It is not the truth. So as a matter of fact, here's what I've discovered. Oftentimes, busyness, don't miss this, is an indicator of a lack of purpose. Ooh, not proof of purpose. Trust me, I know. Wait a minute, Pastor. I, I don't know if I agree with that now. Well, just, just ride with me for a few more minutes, and I believe we are going to end up at the same destination. See, here's my testimony. While I look back over my life, I remember that by the time I was 25 years old, 
I had already attempted suicide three times. By the time I was 25 years old, I had already attempted suicide three times. And each time I attempted suicide, I didn't write a note. I didn't talk to anyone before the attempts. I didn't even drop any clues so that those who were close to me would kind of, you know, pick up on what was going on. Nope, I did none of those things. I did none of those things because my purpose, desire, and design, plan, strategy was to die. Was to die at the hands of my own demise. What most people don't know, though, is that of the three times that I actually physically attempted suicide, there were ten times more of the times when I would be sitting somewhere in seclusion or sitting somewhere in darkness or sitting somewhere on the side of the road with a gun pressed against my temple or under my neck or with the barrel in my mouth, with the finger on the trigger and the safety disengaged. What most people don't know is that between the age of 19 and 25, the thought of killing myself was as constant for me as breathing. I woke up with it, I went to sleep with it, and I woke up with it again. Many years later, when I began to share my story, especially in the church, people were, and some still are, utterly shocked that that was my situation. Utterly shocked that that was my life. Here's why. Because for many years, you know, I, I was the person who was busy. I was busy going, busy doing, busy, busy, busy. Anybody who's known me for any length of time, they know me as a go-getter. They know me as a very active person. They know me as a person that's always doing, don't miss this, always smiling, and please don't miss this, always busy. So when I began to share my testimony about being depressed, severely depressed, and being suicidal and attempting suicide on three different occasions and constantly thinking about death and dying, they were like, oh my God, we had no clue. And this is why I'm teaching this tonight, because oftentimes people who are truly struggling and battling with this subject and this issue, oftentimes they are the ones that are smiling. They are the ones that are making you laugh. They are the ones that are preaching to congregations and singing songs and bringing joy in the lives of so many people. But on the inside, there is a storm that seems to never ever rest or disappear. I want to speak to those of you tonight who can identify with what I'm teaching and sharing. And for those of you that can't, listen to me very carefully. It's imperative and important that you listen to me as well, because I promise you that if you have never struggled with what I'm teaching tonight, I promise you there is someone within arm's reach of your household that has. There is someone in your church. There is someone in your family. There is someone on your job. There is someone in your neighborhood who is grasping for life with the biggest smile you've ever seen. Why? Because oftentimes we are not allowed or we do not feel comfortable sharing these kind of things because we are afraid or concerned about the stigmatism that will soon follow once we share with people that I'm struggling that I think about death all the time, that I, I'm depressed. I think about suicide all the time. And you oftentimes get thrown off path because oftentimes these are people who are doing well in life. These can be people who have plenty of money, living in a nice house, driving the best car, got an awesome job, got a beautiful family, amazing prestige in the city. And sometimes those are the very people that are struggling. Those are the very people, if you notice, they're extremely busy. Man, I got to tell you something. It wasn't until many years later that even I realized there's a big difference between being busy and being productive. Hmm. And you got to catch this. Catch this with one hand now. You can be busy and not be productive. Woo! Somebody better catch that. I'm going somewhere. You can be busy. I'm talking about super busy and still not be productive. Somebody say, Pastor, oh, Pastor, how is that possible? I'm so glad you asked. It's possible because to be truly productive, you must be living a life of purpose. And when you're not living a life of purpose, you're just going to be busy doing this, doing that, schedule full. But if you aren't living a life of purpose, 
then you're not going to be fulfilling your purpose and you're just going to be busy. And here's what I know about being busy. Busy is no barrier against depression. Woo, good God Almighty. As a matter of fact, I believe that busyness is an invitation for depression. I also tell you this, that no matter how confident, how strong you are, you will have to deal with tough times from time to time in your life. I know I can get an amen from somebody out there who also has to deal with tough times from time to time. And you're confident, you're strong. Shucks, you love the Lord, you're saved, you have a great relationship with God, but that does not make you exempt from those seasons and those moments where things are going to get tough. Things are not going to go your way. The weight of disappointment is going to hit you harder than normal. Here's what I want you to hear me say tonight. Here's what I want you to learn tonight. That depression increases when hope decreases. Oh my God, this is good. Can I say that again? Depression increases when hope decreases. This is why even though you can be extremely confident and extremely strong, there are things that tick away at our hope. When I say tick, I think about time. Sometimes we can be waiting in faith, believing for so long that something's going to manifest or things are going to improve or we're finally going to catch a big break. But time seems to diss us and time keeps going and going and going. And we seem stuck in the same situation or even worse, things get worse the longer we wait. It is in those situations that I want to sound an alarm and tell you, mayday, mayday, mayday. You must be on high alert because your hope is being ticked away at. Your hope is being snatched from you. And when your hope decreases, I got a witness somewhere, depression, it increases. It increases because it becomes difficult to explain to yourself why things haven't improved. It becomes difficult to explain to yourself why you should continue to believe and why you should continue to be optimistic. Why? Because you've done everything you know how to do. And let me tell you something. When you start to lose your hope, you better be careful because I have found out that's an open door for the spirit of depression to come in and take residency in your life. So here's the truth about losing your hope. And I hope somebody can identify with this who's already been through what I'm talking about. It's easy, and I know this to be a fact. It is easy to lose your hope without even noticing you've lost your hope. Ooh, I know that to be a fact. It's easy, man. It's easy for your hope to slowly but surely leave your life, and you don't even realize, man, I'm walking right here hopeless. I'm walking right here no longer believing, no longer expecting the, the good to happen in life, I'm expecting the worst. I'm, I'm looking for things to go wrong. I, I'm not looking for anything good to come my way. I'm looking for the bottom to fall out. And you don't even realize it that your hope has been depleted because hope can disappear and dissipate like that and you not even be aware of it oftentimes until it's too late. That's why I'm teaching this Bible class tonight. That's why I'm tackling this subject tonight. That's why I'm being transparent with you tonight, because I want to stop it before it becomes too late. Here's what I want you to know as we talk about depression and suicide. Hope matters. Somebody's got to catch this tonight. Hope is important. Shucks, catch this. Hope is power. Maybe you knew it, maybe you didn't, but receive it and, and hold on to it for the rest of your life. Hope is power. I'll do you one, Ben, that. Here's my favorite one. Hope is a weapon. Hope is a west weapon, Pastor? Absolutely. Hope is a we weapon against what? Hope is a weapon against depression. Oh, that are, oh that's a little Jay-Z right there. Hope is a weapon against depression. Yeah, hope is a weapon against depression. One more time. Hope is a weapon against depression. I'm singing it because I want you to get it in your spirit. Hope is a weapon against depression. And when you don't have hope, you don't have weapons to fight your depression. And let me say this to you, those of you who may still not quite understand how a pastor who leads a congregation, married for 32 years, about to be 52 years of age, three adult children, how does he find himself 
having to have fought the fight of depression? How does he himself have to deal with the fight against the seduction of suicide? Well, let me explain this to those of you who may have just been so fortunate that you've never had to deal with these issues. Depression is a spirit. It's not anything that I have done. It's not anything that anybody else has done or deserves. It's a spirit, much like the Bible says that the enemy, who is a spirit, goes to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. Of course, depression is a sneaky little spirit. It doesn't come looking like a devil or a demon. It doesn't come in some red outfit with a pitchfork. No, depression is, is way too slick for that. Depression will slide up on you so smooth that you don't even know you're depressed. You just know you don't have any enthusiasm. You just know you don't feel like getting up and going anywhere, doing anything. You just know, you know, you feel more comfortable sitting in the dark than you do in the light. So you keep the lights off. Depression is slick. And that's how it gets a lot of people because it doesn't come blaring a foghorn saying depression is coming. No, it sneaks up on you like a smooth criminal. I am sounding the alarm. I am raising the flag. I am highlighting particular things that you can look for because I stand on the other side of the battle letting you know that victory is obtainable and maintainable. I want you to be encouraged and not discouraged. I want you to know whoever you are, you're not in this fight by yourself. I know people don't talk about this, but that's why God placed it on my heart this morning because I already know in my spirit, there's somebody watching this. You're on the verge of attempting suicide. And for people to know it would shock them and blow their minds because when they see you, you look like you've got it all together. When they see you, you look like the picture of success. You look like the picture of happiness. But there's something on the inside that is not quite right. There's something on the inside that will not allow you to rest. There's something on the inside that continues to pull at you. And it's something that's very dark. It's something that's very depressing. It's something that's very oppressive. But the good news is that you can overcome that thing. How do you overcome it? Number one, you got to keep hope alive. Come here, Jesse Jackson. See, hope is a weapon against depression. Why is that important? Because hope can empower you to keep moving forward. But check this out. Hopelessness can cause you to give up on your dreams. See, hope, that's what makes you take another step. Hope, that's what keeps you believing after you've fallen on your face again. Hope is what keeps you trusting in God when things seem like God you know, it's just really not on your side. Hope says, come on, you can make it. Hope says, come on, don't give up. Hope says, listen to Pastor Troy tonight and, and, and see what he's going to say. And, and maybe, maybe there's something in this lesson that's going to bless you. See, hope is the thing that pulls us when we don't want to be pulled. Ooh, I know that to be the truth. Hope is that thing that pushes us when we don't want to be pushed. And it can literally Give us the courage and the confidence and the stamina to take one more step, one more day. That's why you have to renew your hope every single day. You have to renew your hope each day so that when the next day shows up, you've got what you need to take another step forward. Because if you ever get stuck with hopelessness, it'll cause you to give up on your dreams. I stop by to tell you that this is not a time to give up on your dreams. This is not a time to quit. This is not a time to throw your hands in the air and surrender. No, this is a time for you to believe that God loves you more than you can ever imagine. I want you to know that God loves you so much that I literally do believe that God sent me tonight to teach this lesson. I believe that somebody's life is going to be saved tonight. I literally believe that somebody's going to watch this and they're going to report back to me, Pastor Troy, you don't know me or maybe I do know him. And I was determined to end my life. 
but I was led to watch your video and now I have hope and I also have understanding which will help me navigate those dark moments, navigate those dark places. And I know those dark places very, very well. See, sometimes we feel like there's no way up. Man, there are times we feel like there's no way through. Sometimes we feel like there is no way out. I've been there. I don't mind telling you. But let me tell you something. When you feel like there's no way up, I learned this. When you feel like there's no way through what you're trying to go through and you feel like there's no way out of where you're in right now, let me tell you something. Hope is always there. Hope is always there even when it feels like there's no way out, no way through, and no way up. Hope is always there. Here's what you have to do. You have to hold on to that hope and absolutely refuse to let it go. You got to hold on to it when it makes no sense to hold on to it. Why? Because now you understand that hope is a weapon. It's a weapon against depression. And let me tell you something. I have dealt with extreme low self-esteem. I have dealt with depression, several bouts of reoccurring suicidal thoughts and several suicidal attempts. I've dealt with it all. And here's what I want you to know. If you are going through a rough time, and you think there's no way out and you think that there's no way through and you think that there's no way things are going to get better for you. Here's how you never lose your hope again. Oh, this is going to be good. I want you to catch this with two hands. Number one, make peace with this truth. Here's the truth I want you to make peace with. There's no perfect life. This is one of the major things that helped me. There's no perfect life. Come on, I need everybody to say it with me tonight. There's no perfect life. Make peace with that truth. Now, I know folks have mastered the art of appearance and people make you think that they have the perfect life. You look at them on Facebook. You look at them on Instagram. You look at them in Hollywood. You look at them driving down the street in an expensive car. You look at them living in the big house in the expensive side, on the expensive side of town, you know, and, and you start looking at people and everything about them seems to glitter. Everything about them just seems to be perfectly in place. Let me tell you something. There are no perfect lives. And the sooner you make peace with that, the sooner you're going to be able to live a happier life. Why? Because you're not chasing an illusion. See, sometimes we're frustrated and aggravated because we're chasing something that doesn't exist because we don't know that what we're chasing doesn't exist. I stop to tell you tonight, there are no perfect, perfect lives. So your life will never be perfect no matter how hard you try. It'll never be perfect. Even when you get the car, even when you get the house, even when you get the husband and the wife and the children, even when you get the dream job, I promise you, your life still will not be perfect. You, you, you really got to embrace this. Somebody's got to hear me tonight that no matter what you do, life is not going to be perfect. Not on this side of glory. It's just not going to happen. Here's what your life can be, though. Your life can be happy. Mm -hmm. Your life can be happy, but not perfect. That's right. Your life can be happy, but not perfect. If you recognize that, then you'll stop chasing perfection and you'll start embracing happiness. Oh, this is good teaching. So what I want you to do, make peace with this truth that there are no perfect lives. So you got to choose. Then I pray you'll choose tonight to live a happy life. In whatever state you're in, whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, you have to decide, you know what? I'm going to be happy right here, right now, with or without the things I want, the things I need, the people I want, the people I think I need. In this moment, I'm going to make a conscious decision. You have that much power to decide, I'm just going to be happy right here, right now. You can be happy even doing unhappy times. Boy, it took me a while to learn this one. You can be happy during unhappy events. And catch this, you can really even be happy in unhappy situations. Why? Because happiness is not an emotion. Please catch this with two hands because I'm about to say something. Happiness is not an emotion. Happiness is a devotion. <laughs> See, you're talking to somebody who used to struggle with being happy, struggle being happy because my happiness was predicated 
upon how much money I had in the bank or how much money I had in my pocket. Or it was predicated on what I was driving or what where I was living or what I was eating or my ability to take a trip or my ability to go out and ball and spend money or my ability to, to do certain things that I saw other people doing. My happiness was hinged on the wrong framework. Ooh, good God Almighty. And when your happiness is hinged on the wrong framework, then let me tell you something. You will be living a life miserable because you have not recognized that happiness is not an emotion. Happiness is a devotion. Boy, that's good to me. In other words, happiness is a choice, not a chase. I got to say that again. Happiness is a choice, not a chase. And anything that you're chasing in the name of happiness, you need to stop tonight. Anything that you're chasing and you think, you believe, you have convinced yourself, when I get that, I'm going to be happy. When I get there, I'm going to be happy. If I get that person in my life, ooh, I know I'm going to be happy. Stop it. You are torturing yourself and sabotaging your life because happiness is a choice, not a chase. Here's a few tips that I hope can help you in line with what I'm teaching you about making peace with this truth that there's no perfect life. Learn how to turn your failures and your disappointments into success. You got plenty of them. <laughs> See, I learned how to find the silver lining, man. I learned how to be optimistic. Shucks, I used to be that person, man, who, who didn't know how to turn my failures and disappointments into success. And then I started recognizing, what am I going to do with all this failure? What am I going to do with all these disappointments? Because God knows I got a lot of them. Well, I can't throw them away because they are part of who I am. They are part of my experience. They are part of my journey. I can't throw them away because they are part of me. Then I must have understood at some point in my life that I could take those failures and those disappointments and I could turn them into successes. I could take them and squeeze them for every drop of wisdom, every drop of knowledge, every drop of understanding. I could squeeze them and squeeze them and whatever came out of them, I could use to make me a better man. I could use to make me a wiser man. I could use to make me a stronger man. And that's what I've done in my life. And I tell you what, it was one of the best decisions that I've done. It's not just what I've done in my life. It's what I do even to this day because failures and disappointments don't stop. I don't care who you are or where you are. You're still going to have some failures. You're still going to have some disappointments. But if you know what to do with them, you can make them work together for your good. Number two, cultivate positive thinking. Oh, this is great teaching. And I say cultivate it because oftentimes we are not born as positive thinkers. Oftentimes we don't live in communities where we are surrounded by positive thinkers, but you can cultivate positive thinking. In other words, learn how to arrest your negative thoughts when they try to arrest you. Ooh, this is good teaching. Learn how to catch yourself. When you say something that's out of line with who you want to be and where you're trying to go, catch yourself, cancel what you've spoken, and then speak a better word in the place of the negative word that you spoke. Things like, I, I, I never have any money. When the next time you say that, say, you know what? Stop. I cancel that. I always have money. Hmm. See, what you're doing, you're sowing seeds for your future. Why would you sow a seed that simply verifies a state or a situation that you want nullified? Mm. Does it make sense to keep sowing and growing something you don't want? So you cannot continue to speak what is if what is ain't what you want to keep in your life as you go forward. No, speak those things that are not as though they be. I'm blessed. I'm healthy. I'm wise. Everybody love me. Everybody love me. Now, we know everybody don't love you, but that's okay. Speak it into existence and then watch how much more love you experience in your life. I got to go. Are y'all getting this? Number three, number three, number three, number three. Surround yourself with positive people only. Okay, this is one of my pet peeves right here. Slow down. Surround yourself with positive people only. Pastor Troy, is that possible? Shh, you better believe me it's possible. Now, everybody's not going to like it. Everybody's not going to understand it. But I have learned to exercise the power of my own domain. 
I choose who gets to be in the circumference of my life. I choose who spends time with me or I spend time with. I don't go anywhere I don't want to go. I don't laugh if it ain't funny. And I don't dance if I don't like the music. Mm, why? Because I made up in my mind, I'm not shucking and jiving for nobody. I made up in my mind that I'm not going to be some clown that entertains people just so that I can feel like I'm a part of something. No, 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 no. I only want to be a part of positive people's lives and I only want positive people's lives to be a part of my life. So I am very particular and meticulous about embracing the positive mm -hmm, and rejecting the negative. It makes a difference. Why? Because I'm trying to protect my spirit. I'm trying to protect my energy. I'm trying to protect my attitude. I've been depressed and I don't want to be depressed no more. And let me just be honest with you. Some people can be very depressing. Some people can be very depressing because they never have a positive word. They never have a positive outlook. And if you tell them you're trying to do something adventurous, they are just automatically inclined to shoot you down and discourage you and tell you why you can't do it. Uh-uh. You have got to go. You can't be with me no more. I love you. I pray for you. I love you from afar. But as far as you and me walking side by side, we cannot because how can two walk together except they first agree? This is good teaching. Number two, is this blessing you? I'm encouraging somebody tonight who's not going to be depressed. You're not going to allow depression to snuff you out. And you're going to learn how to wrestle with those spirits. You're going to learn how to wrestle with those moments to try to take you to the dark place. We're not going to the dark place anymore. As a matter of fact, we're going to be the light mm -hmm, that's going to shine bright in every situation. Number two, here's what you got to learn to do. Make peace with your mistakes. Oh, I like this lesson tonight. Make peace with your mistakes. What do you mean, Pastor Troy? Here's a little tip. Don't live out of your mistakes. I used to do that. I used to live constantly thinking about, oh, I messed up again. Especially being a believer, especially being a, a follower of Christ, being a Christian, somebody that loves God. Man, when I when I would fall into sin, let's let's be 100. Bet you don't hear a lot of pastors talk about that. Yeah, when I would fall into sin, do something I shouldn't have done, say something I, I shouldn't have said, you know what I'm saying, thought something I shouldn't have thought, man, I would find myself going into depression. I would find myself going into depression because I would beat up on myself so brutally. I would beat myself down and I would talk down to myself and about myself, and I could feel my spirit slowly, slowly, slowly slipping into the dark place. And I'll never forget, God spoke to me on, a, on one occasion in particular and said, you know, you know that's not me, right? I said, huh? He says, you know that's not me that, that's, that's bringing you down and making you feel the way that you feel. And I, and I said, well, God, I, 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 know, I know it was you, or at least I thought it was you because I... I sinned. I, I messed up. I, I said something I shouldn't have said. I, I did something I shouldn't have done. And, and God said, no, no, that's that's never me. I'm not the God of guilt. Ooh. <laughs> I'm the God of agape. Mm. I'm not the God of condemnation. I'm the God of conviction. All I do is make you recognize the error of your ways so that you can recalibrate and repent and continue to walk with me. He said, I don't get any joy out of pressing you down into darkness. When you fall, as a matter of fact, when you fall, I show up not to crush you, but to lift you because a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. See, these are the things you got to learn about yourself. But more importantly, you got to learn about God and your spirit. So when you start feeling things, you don't start thinking, oh, that's God. So I must accept it. Oh, that's God. So I got to just endure this. Oh, that's God. So I just need to get through this. No, oftentimes what you think is God is not God. It's you suppressing and depressing you in the name of the spirit of darkness. Oh, this is good teaching. So here's what I'm telling you tonight. This is priceless. Do not live out of your mistakes. Matter of fact, do this. Live out of the lessons you learned from the mistakes. <laughs> That's good right there. Key word, live. If you're going to live, don't live out of your mistakes. Live out of the lessons you've learned. 
Number three, I got to go. Can you catch this one? I pray to God you're being blessed. I feel really good right now. Number three, make, modify, and maintain a plan. Let me say it again. Make, modify, and maintain a plan. See, life without a plan will bring depression. Facts. I'm talking about big facts. Life without a plan. You just freestyling. You just going with the flow. Wherever the wind blows or even worse, wherever the crowd goes, that's what you're doing? Oh, you following the crowd? Oh, wow. Yeah, you are heading for depression because life demands a plan. Now, I admit, at least I hope you probably got a lot of goals. I hope you have many goals. I hope you have many dreams. But let me ask you a question. Do you have an actual plan? Because hmm. a hope and dreams and goals without a plan, it's really a waste of time. Do you know what you should do each day to reach your goals and your dreams? See, that's the purpose of a plan. A plan makes it plain. Habakkuk 2 and 2 says it this way. Write the vision. Make it plain so that he who reads it may run with it. Well, you're the one that's going to read it because it's your vision. So God says you need to have something set before your eyes because it gives you necessary logistics for the navigation of the destination that you desire to reach, have, and obtain. Your plan literally inspires you to work smart, stay focused, and never give up. When you don't have a plan, you don't have anything that inspires you to do any of those things. So you got to get a plan. Your plan is paramount. Why? Because your plan shows you the right direction. And I, trust me on this. The, the plan is going to help you be successful. So if you don't have a plan yet, today, let today be the day. Whenever this video is seen by you, make that the moment that you create yourself a plan. Mm, that's good teaching right there. Number four, I got to go. Replace short-term dreaming with long-term thinking. Let me take a sip of lemonade because my throat is a little parched. That'd give you a few minutes to write it down if you're taking notes. Replace short-term dreaming with long-term thinking. Here's what I know, and I teach people this all the time. I, I, I tell people this. Play the long game not the short game. I say that so much that I know somebody gets tired of me saying it, but I find need to keep saying it because I keep finding people playing the short game. I keep, I keep finding people who are determined to find a shortcut. I keep dealing with people who are obsessed and will spend copious numbers of hours trying to find a shortcut. And one of the things I've been saying for years is that oftentimes when you take a shortcut, you get cut short. I'm going to tell you something that's the truth, and it's a hard truth. 99% of the time, there are no shortcuts to the things you want, the places you want to go, or the person that you want to become. There really are no shortcuts. So here's what I want you to do. Play the long game. Stop thinking short term, because when you think short term, you're ill prepared for the long journey. Mm. See, when you think short term, you want it quick. And when it doesn't come quick, what happens? You want to quit. See, when you think in the long term, it's harder to lose your hope. When you think in long term, it's harder to be discouraged. When you think in long term, it's harder to be depressed. Why? Because you prepared for the long term. You were prepared for the long term. You were prepared for the long haul. You were prepared for the long journey. So you don't quit easily. Why? Because you were mentally and spiritually and maybe even physically prepared to endure whatever you had to endure until you reach wherever it is you're trying to get in life. I'll give you a good example. Let's say you got your paycheck today. Now you can spend all your money at once. Or you can spend your money on stuff you don't need. Or you can spend your money trying to impress somebody. Or you can spend your money buying something that you already got a bunch of, but you're such a creature of habit that you just go ahead and buy something you don't need again. That is short term. Or you could think long term. You could spend your money when you really needed to buy something that you really need. Or you could save your money and 
plan for a vacation or you could pay a bill off or reduce your debt or you can invest in something that's going to increase your money so that your money is working for you and you're not working for your money. All of those are what I'm calling long-term thinking. The more you embrace long-term thinking, the more you're going to have joy in life because you are working towards a goal. People tell me I work hard and I know I work hard. They say I'm one of the hardest working people they know and I don't know about that. I do know that I, uh, I'll never be called lazy. But I got a secret for you. The reason why I can work hard and the reason why I do work hard is because I think long term. I'm working hard because there were things I desire and places I desire to go and things I desire to have. And I kind of allow those things to kind of be like the carrot that is dangling before me. It is what really gives me my motivation and my drive to continue to go forward because I know there's going to be a reward if I continue, if I continue to think long term. Hope that blessed you. Number five, I got to go. Don't let others take you for granted. This may be one of the most important things I'm going to say because I have found that depression can come in your life if you're someone who's a people pleaser or you're someone who has found themselves in a position where you allow people to take you for granted. See, when you allow people to take you for granted, life seems pointless. Here's what I want you to do. This will help somebody learn how to say no when you don't feel like doing something that you simply don't have to do. Learn how to say no. Exercise your right to say no. Here's what I've learned. People will respect you more than ever when you start saying no. They'll stop asking you to do stupid stuff. And they'll just they'll stop asking you to do stuff that they could do themselves. And oftentimes folks will ask you because they know you'll do it so they don't have to do it. No, sometimes you can just say no just for the heck of it. And when they ask you why, be very clear. Tell them because I don't want to. Have a great day and do it with a smile. I'll tell you this. Not only will people respect you more. Here's the most important thing about this. You will respect yourself more. See, depression comes in when you know you aren't doing right by yourself. Depression comes in when you know you want your own best friend. Depression comes in when you aren't looking out for yourself the way you should because you keep trying to please everybody else and you allow yourself to be used, abused, and unappreciated. Bring that to an end and watch how your life will flourish. Number six. <coughs> Number six. Are y'all being blessed? Find someone who has a similar goal or dream as you do. God, this is another powerful thing to do that will ward off depression, help you fight suicide. Yeah, find somebody. No man is an island. No man stands alone, okay? You aren't some superhero out here fighting crime by yourself. No, no, no. We all need somebody. I've been teaching for the last 15 years. Every dreamer needs a dream team. Let me say that again. Every dreamer needs a dream team. But you can't put just anybody on your team. Only put people on your team who have similar goals and similar dreams as you. Why? Because birds of a feather flock together and they all end up at the same destination. That's the power of synergy. The power of synergy is so powerful that when like-minded people start to flow together, ooh, the flow becomes amazing. The flow becomes immaculate. The flow becomes even more powerful. Why? Because everybody's rowing in the same direction. Make, don't miss this. Make, catch this. Make, this is super important. Make your relationships purpose driven. Woo! Preach, Pastor Troy. What do you mean, Pastor? You heard me. Make your relationships purpose driven. And watch your relationships drive your purpose. Oh my God, this is. Woo. I got to stay calm. Can I say that again? Because this is really important. Somebody needed that. Make your relationships, starting right now, make your relationships purpose driven. If it doesn't have a purpose, then we should not have a relationship. I'm talking friendships. I'm talking kinships. I'm talking all the ships. If it doesn't produce, provide a purpose, then I want to encourage you to cut it. Why? Because every relationship, should be purpose driven. Promise you when that happens, watch it drive your purpose. Number seven, I got to go. Get out of your rut. Get out of your cycle and get out of your routine at least, at least, please hear this, once a week. 
Oh, I'm talking about how to fight depression, how to combat suicide. How's that going to help me, Pastor? Well, here's how it's going to help you. Most of the time when we start doing the same thing over and over again, we get this sense of boredom. We get this sense of unfulfillment. And it's really just rooted in and, and really grounded in the fact that we're in a rut. It's rooted and grounded in the fact that we are in a cycle like that hamster on that little treadmill, that we're in a routine. But listen, you've got the power that you need to shake things up. So what you have to do is at least once a week, you got to shake up your own routine, get out of the rut, get out of the cycle, take a different route to work, take a different route home. Once a week, do something you don't normally do. At least once a week, forget about your projects, your household chores, your TV shows, your media, and that doggone cell phone. Once a week, and maybe take a small trip to a, a less crowded place. Take a small trip to a place where you can just kind of take in nature. Mm, learn to disrupt your rut. Learn to disrupt your cycle. Learn to disrupt your routine. By making time and taking time, don't miss this, to observe and enjoy the simple things in life. I teach people all the time. I hear people say, Pastor, you know, I, just say, I, don't, I don't have any money. I don't have money to do this and money to do that. And I say, stop, 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 shut up. Quiet, 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 quiet. Listen, 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 listen. If you can learn to appreciate the little things in life, a whole lot of us need to go back to appreciating the little things in life. We become so advanced that if it's not electronic, we don't know how to function. Go back to the little things in life. For me, I tell you, water, water is my thing, man. You put me by a lake or by an ocean or by a river, and man, I have a woo moment, woo Everything in me slows down and my mind begins to find a different level of peace and freedom. It's simple things, something as simple as water. And when I can't get to water, guess what? I listen to the sounds of water. I listen to the sounds of the beach or the sounds of the ocean. And man, let me tell you something. Just that simple thing allows me to shake up my schedule, get out of my rut. Why? Because I'm not a robot. So many people I know are living like a robot when we are human beings. Get out of your rut. Break up your cycle. And I promise you, you'll find more joy finding its way. Why? Because your life is not so predictable. It's, no, it's not so mundane because you are shocking your pattern of living. I got to go. I think this is next to the last one. Number eight, invest in your rest. Invest in your rest. Someone actually said this to me a week or two ago, that they had found how wonderful it was to invest in their rest. And I said, you know, that's a beautiful concept. That's a powerful piece of wisdom to live by. Invest in your rest. You know, we spend money on so many things, but how much money have you spent on your rest? Hmm. Have you made a, a substantial investment in the mattress that you sleep on? Hmm. What kind of pillows are you laying your head down at night? What kind of sheets are you sleeping in between? Hmm. See, if you don't invest in your rest, then you may have a hard time resting. Rest is important because you can't do anything if you ain't recuperating. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. Invest in your rest. We live in a busy, busy world where being busy is popular now. And so many people are suffering from diseases. You want to know why? Because they're not resting. Plain and simple. Our bodies are programmed to rest so we can heal. If you're not resting, your body can't do what God created it to do. And we walk around sick when sometimes the only thing we need is rest. Your body needs rest. And God knows this is the truth. Your mind needs rest. I'm talking about real rest. I'm talking about undisturbed rest. Oh, you see, when the last time you had some uninterrupted rest? Nobody's going to give it to you. You got to take it. You got to schedule it. You got to make it happen. If you need a nap, take a nap. If you want to sleep in on the day that you're off, you sleep in on the day that you're off. You don't owe anybody any explanation. What are you doing? You are resting so that your soul stays refreshed and depression doesn't have a chance to attach itself to you. Why? Because you are energizing yourself. Invest in your rest. Somebody going to thank me for that one. And then number nine, you may thank me for this one more than any other. Allow yourself to have a bad moment. 
without allowing a bad moment to come a bad day. Let me say it again. Allow yourself to have a bad moment without allowing a bad moment to become a bad day. Someone asked me, I don't know, a few months ago, maybe last year, do you ever have a bad, bad day, Pastor Troy? And I responded, no, nope, I do not. I do not ever have a bad day. And they said, wait a minute now, how, how is that possible? I mean, you seem like you're always happy and upbeat, but I, surely you have a bad day every now and then. I says, nope, nope, I do not have bad days anymore. And they say, well, how is that even possible? I said, it's possible because I learned that just because I have a bad moment doesn't mean I have to have a bad day. Just because I have a bad moment doesn't mean I have to allow that bad moment to ruin my whole day. So I've learned that when I have a bad moment, I pause for the cause. I acknowledge that bad moment. I was like, you did your thing. Yeah, you showed out. That was a bad moment. But then I say to that bad moment, okay, you're dismissed. Mm -hmm. You can go now. You can go now because I refuse to let you ruin my entire day. Yeah, bad moment, yes. Bad day, not having it. Why? Because I don't know how many days I have left. You don't know how many days you have left. And you don't have, you have, you don't have any days to waste making a whole day a bad day because you had a bad moment. You, you're a better investor than that. So don't let a bad moment become a bad day. Having a bad moment isn't the end of the world. Man, I had to learn this. Having a bad moment isn't the end of the world, brothers and sisters. And making a mistake, guess what? Isn't a reason to give up. We all have bad moments. We all make mistakes. Here's what you got to do. In those moments, stay strong, stay focused, and stay free from the weight and the pressures of this life. And if you do, you'll be glad you did. I want to close with a few scriptures just to tie all of this together for you. Psalms 30 and 5 says, Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. What that means is that we will have seasons and moments and settings and situations where we may cry. But God says, always remember that tears and trouble don't last always. Every cloud is going to run out of rain sooner or later. The question is, can you stand the rain? Come here, new edition. All right, 1 Peter 5 and 7 says this, casting all your cares or your anxieties on him, God. Why? Because he cares for you. And I need everybody to catch this as I get ready to close. When what we carry, mm, this is good, causes us to want to end our journey in life, that's when it's time to cast our cares on God. Romans 8 and 28, one of my favorites. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, you have to believe that this is an absolute truth. That even when things are bad and ugly, that some way, somehow, your God, your Father, is somewhere working them together to produce and create something that you will look at and say, you know what? I couldn't have had this and I wouldn't have gotten here if it wasn't for that. It's called trusting God, having God for dense, confidence in God, knowing that because he loves you the way that he does, that even the worst days of your life are going to turn around and produce some of the best days of your life. This is the lesson that I wanted to share, how I defeated the spirit of depression and why I still have to fight the seduction of suicide. Somebody said, do you still have to fight the seduction of suicide? From time to time, I do. From time to time, I do. That spirit tries to revisit itself on my life. For those that don't understand why or how that's possible, anytime you've grappled with something and struggled with something, the Bible says that when the enemy, the devil, Lucifer, when he is swept clean of a house. He always revisits that house. And when he revisits that house, he brings with him seven more that are stronger than he. Well, you got to recognize that this is a journey and this is a battle. But here's the good news, that even though I may wrestle from time to time, I have the victory. Because as long as I'm wrestling, I'm going to be all right. When I'm not wrestling, I'm in trouble. And I used to think it was strange. I would think it was strange that that, that thought would come upon me. And, and here's the crazy part. It would come upon me at some of the most successful times in my life. It would come upon me with, with money in my pocket. It would come upon me with success 
on every hand. It would, it would come upon me when I was walking in a sea of notoriety. It would come and visit me. And I thought, well, this is strange. This is an odd time for me to be thinking these thoughts. And then that's what I recognized, that that spirit came back and comes back to see if it can get in. But I am living proof in 2020 that if you will do the maintenance on your mind ooh, and do the maintenance on your soul and your spirit, he will come. And when I say he, I mean the spirit of darkness, the spirit of depression, the spirit of suicide. He will come and he will find that the key that he had that used to unlock the door that gave him entrance into your life, that lock has been changed and the key he has doesn't work anymore. I'm, I'm a picture of what God can do. I'm a picture of victory, but I'm also a picture of the constant battle that one must engage in his mind, in his soul, in his spirit. I wanna encourage you to take a page out of my life. One of the scriptures in the Bible that comes to my mind now that says, take heed lest you fall. I think sometimes we as Christians and we as believers uh, like to pretend or like to fool everybody. I don't have time for that. I'm going to keep it real. I'm going to keep it 100. That's why I call this real talk with Pastor Troy, because if you can't be honest, you can't be healed. And whatever you're struggling with tonight, take it to God. Get in a quiet place and say, God, I heard a message tonight that really spoke to me. And I just want to openly admit, I want to tell you what you already know. I'm struggling. I'm wrestling with these thoughts and I open my heart to you for your strength, your wisdom and your guidance. And I declare victory over my life. I declare success over my life. I declare that depression will not defeat me. I declare that suicide will not dominate me. I declare that I shall live and I shall not die. You declare that every day. Practice the principle, principles that I've given you tonight. And I promise you, your life is going to be the better for it. Well, that's my time for tonight. My prayer is that somebody's life will be saved. My prayer is that a million people will see this and something positive and impactful will happen in their soul and in their spirits. If this has been a blessing to you and you are uh, willing to share how it's blessed you, I would be honored to read it in my leisure. But most importantly, I pray and ask you personally to share this video as many times as possible because you never know somebody close to you may need to hear what I've said tonight and it just might save their life. God bless you. I love you. I'm praying for you. This has been Real Talk with Pastor Troy Wynn Sr., Senior Pastor of the Freedom Church, located at 820 North Houston Road, Warner Robins, Georgia. If you're anywhere near the vicinity on Sunday morning, join us at 11 a.m. We're physically meeting on Sundays, and our Bible studies are online on Wednesdays. I would love to have you be our guest and experience this life that we love and enjoy and that we share with everybody we can. It is possible to come out of darkness and not just walk in the light. It's possible to come out of darkness, don't, catch, don't miss this, and be the light. To be the person that shines so bright that people can't even believe that you used to struggle with depression and suicide. Guys, have a great night. Thank you for your time and thank you for sharing this video.